It's not quite like a gong, but it's close. That's funny. I'm trying to warm up the crowd here. They don't seem to be, be cooperating. Don't worry, I'll warm up. Okay, good. All right, uh, thank you all for coming today. I'll, I understand some of you may have had more choice than others, but uh, we're all happy that you're, that you're here. <laughs> Um, so I am uh, Jay Antle. I am the director of the college's sustainability center here at Johnson County Community College. Uh, I'm also a, a historian. If any of you need to take a history class one of these days, I don't bite. Uh, I don't bite. At least I don't think I do. Uh, so, but I was asked to say a little bit about what, what we do here on campus. Um, the campus farm reports to up through our office. How many of you knew we had a campus farm? Okay, two and a half acres. Uh, we also do work with alternative energy and energy efficiency on campus, um, lots of work with curriculum, which of course is one of the reasons what we're doing what we're doing today. So if you, by the way, have any questions about what we do, uh, our website is here, and you can even go to our dashboards and uh, find out about our composting program, our recycling program, and uh, even our energy savings. And uh, we have solar energy on campus. Uh, how many of you knew that? Okay. I hope at the very least you've seen our, uh, our solar picnic tables that were actually designed and built by Johnson County Community College students. All right, so um, with, with that, I'm going to get out of the way here after I introduce uh, our, our guest speaker who's come to us all the way from uh, the University of Maryland. So um, I uh, was aware of Robin's work as a result of a conference that I went to last year in Washington, D.C., held by the National Council on Science and the Environment. The conference was on environmental health, broadly defined. And um, Robin's work, Dr. Gilden's work, um, has to do with uh, pesticides, risk communication, children's environments, um, which our publications are varied. Uh, we have a publication on integrating sustainability into nursing schools, and some of her latest work has to do with pesticide monitoring on soccer fields via shoe wipes and urine samples. So uh, Robin, Robin does a lot of research. So her, uh, her PhD is uh, in nursing research from the University of Maryland, uh, where she currently, currently teaches. Uh, her, her MS is in community and public health nursing. And her, uh, her BS is uh, in nursing from Salisbury State University. Where I applied for a job. Yeah, I, I, yeah I didn't get interview. Uh, but in any case, um, for many of you, the, the, the linkage of sustainability and nursing may be relatively new, and uh, Dr. Gilden will talk to you about why that matters. Um, lots of questions you'll be happy to take, and there are a few of you I think who will be seeing here again this afternoon and for the workshop setting. So thank you all for coming, and I'd like to uh, hope you will join me in thanking Dr. Gilden for joining us today. So as Jay mentioned, I am Dr. Robin Gilden. Um, I do teach at the University of Maryland where I have lived for the past, hmm, since 2002 when I got my master's, my post-master's, and my doctorate. Um, I was hired on as faculty in 2010, and um, I've had a variety of experiences and I am on the community public health faculty, and I also direct the environmental health certificate. Um, so today, um, and please stop me if you have any questions. I enjoy getting off track. Um, and I have already shared the PowerPoint, so don't worry about taking notes. Um, this is what I'm going to talk about mainly today, um, the various changes um, ways in which climate health, climate impacts human health, and some roles that the climate change work group at our school can perform. And then we're going to talk about possible activities that a climate change work group can do. Um, and we'll come up with some strategies in the afternoon session. But first, since I'm not sure who all um, knows what about environmental health, we need to start with some basics. Okay, so um, who all has had an experience in the community? Just show of hands. Any experience out in the community? Um, educational experience as a nurse. Okay, so 
how do you assess an individual patient vital signs, hands, answers? Nobody? <laughs> how do you assess blood pressure? Cuff, right? How do you assess pulse? Well, you put your finger right there and count. How do you assess respirations? <laughs> oh my goodness. Well, you do the same thing, just at a different way with a community. You check out you know, what's around them. You look at the, what's in their environment, what, you know, what's coming out of the smokestack, what's they, what water they're drinking. If there's any dangerous sites around them, you know, the air emissions, where do they put their garbage? Um, so, back in 1995, um, there was a landmark Institute of Medicine report called in Nursing Health and the Environment. And it, it broke nursing's responsibilities down into four critical areas. Nursing education, education of nurses and the other health care professionals. Nursing practice, which includes education of patients and clients. Nursing policy and advocacy, and nursing research. And so one of my first jobs was to help create a compendium of um, environmental health nursing stories and information. And that's the green book that you see down here. And um, it, when I say environment, what, what comes to mind? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> what about chemicals we're exposed to? What about the air we breathe? the food we eat. All of these things impact us. The environment is whatever we are, wherever we are, whenever we are. And so I took um, a look at this website. How many of you are aware that this website exists on the Kansas Department of Health and the Environment? Good, a couple of you. And I'm just going to put in the college address. One, two, three, four, five. I love that. <laughs> and let's see what pops up. I don't want to change back. And so we have, um, let's see. You can see over here that these are all of the air, um, the um, identified pr environmental problems. And if we go this way, this little upside down red triangle is an identified site um, which is a Superfund or a Brownfield site at the state level, and we're just going to click on it. And it is um, an outlying field number one, and fortunately it's resolved. But you can see that there's a variety of um, sites, and we've got some under um, leaking underground storage tanks, we've got some spills. So this is just around this university. So we also, just gonna put a little plug in for the Environmental Health Certificate at University of Maryland. It is a post-baccalaureate. Um, so when you guys get your BSN, you can come and it's all online depending on what elective you choose. And um, if you'd like more information about it, give me a call or a, send me an email. My contact information is at the end. And it'll help you dig in deeper to environmental health. But 
this is what I really am here to talk about. So this report um, is kind of like the landmark report. It was written by 13 federal agencies um, under the U.S. Global Research Program, which was established by presidential initiative in 1989 and then Congress mandate in 1990. And it was formed to assist the nation and the world to understand, assess, and predict and respond to human-induced and natural processes of global change. And so within this report, you see there are the um, pathways and then going across the climate drivers, the exposure, the health outcome, and then the impact. And there's, in the PowerPoint, there's a link to how to get to these um, reports. So, but I want to talk a little bit about the various pathways. So extreme heat and drought. Um, the average annual carbon levels, carbon dioxide levels, exceeded four parts, 400 parts per million in the first time in the last 800,000 years. The Arctic sea ice in March reached its lowest level in 2015. The average temperature uh, has risen across the United States since 1901, and it reached its uh, increased warming over the 30, past 30 years. And 2012 and 2015 were the warmest years yet. Air pollution and air quality, airborne allergens, will likely increase worsening allergy and um, asthma. Coastal flooding, now you guys don't have to worry about coastal flooding, but those of us on the coast do, um, is likely to increase in many locations along the coast, especially on the East Coast and Gulf Coast. Um, Lyme disease is spreading because of the earlier onset and increased habitat. Um, increased runoff from more frequent and intense storm events and coupled with water temperatures will impact recreational commodity and <coughs> drinking water. Changes in, because of the increased carbon dioxide, nutritional quality of food will change. And this impacts vulnerable populations. Not only the ones that we typically think of, like elderly, pregnant women and children, but then also occupational groups, such as the workers outside and extreme heat in the summer, um, but uh, a dis disabled Americans, chronic conditions, um, low income always, and it disrupts infrastructure. And we only have to look at the hurricanes of the, of the past September, Hurricanes Harvey, Irma, and Maria, and not to mention the wildfires, the earthquakes. Um, so earth, uh, climate change is real and it's happening now. This is just another report, um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, it's the international body for assessing science related to climate change. And again, there's a web link in the notes section. And then just two weeks ago, the Lancet released its next, um, its annual report. Um, it looks at 40 indicators across five areas, and this latest report um, came to three conclusions. Human systems, symptoms of climate change are unequivocal and uh, potentially irreversible. The delayed response to climate change over the past 25 years has jeopardized human life and livelihoods. But the past five years have seen accelerated response, and in 2017, momentum is building across a number of sectors, and there are clear and unprecedented opportunities for public health, including nursing. So there are a lot of professional and systematic statements on climate change. The American Nurses Association House of Delegates has an energy choices um, statement. They also have the environmental health principles for nurses. The American Association of Colleges of Nurses has an environmental sustain sustainability statement for the schools of nursing. The American Public Health Association Public Health Nursing um, has environmental health principles as well. 
and the American Public Health Association also has um, information on climate change, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. So I just want to also draw your attention to the American Nurses Association 2008 House of Delegates resolution on global climate change. Nurses have the responsibility to be aware of broader health concerns. It encourages nurses to have an impact on global health environment. Nurses speak out in a united voice. There are over 3.4 million of us in the United States. If we spoke together on the, with one voice on one issue, we could really have some power um, to advocate for change, endorse sustainability and energy sources, and Basically, we need to support initiatives to decrease contribution to global warming by healthcare industry. The APHA is also part of the Climate for Health. Um, this network of health leaders is committed to protecting health and the well-being of Americans by leading an example and leading by example on a path to positive future for climate solutions. And this is including working within their organization and with their staff, but also outward um, to the nation on policies and solutions. So more related to nursing and healthcare, um, there's healthcare without harm, there's practice green health, and also the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. So, healthcare without harm, who has heard of healthcare without harm? Mm, okay. Um, it's an organization that is made up of lots of healthcare institutions and nurses, um, a variety of different organizations and healthcare um, institutions, representatives of doctors and nurses and um, hospitals, all working to reduce healthcare's impact on environment. Um, and so they have this nurses climate change toolkit with a lot of different resources. Practice Green Health was an organization um, of the American Nurses Association, the American Hospital Association, and the Environmental Protection Agency and they have a climate change and health literacy for health professionals. And again, the links are to this are in the notes section. And the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments, I am on the steering committee and the research work group. Um, so this is the one that I know the best about. Um, and they have a climate change and health work group. And I'll also get into some of the other resources that are available through them in a minute. Okay, and so I realized that um, I did not include Johnson County Community College on this uh, slide, but I could now. <laughs> so at my institution, we have two schools of nursing. Um, there's the one in Baltimore, and then there's the one at Shady Grove. And we have, um, together, we have um, created an outdoor recycling component. We're not as advanced as you guys are here. Um, we've gotten rid of styrofoam cups, and we have centralized printers. We've modified a drinking water, um, we've gotten rid of the water bottle dispensers and replaced them with bottleless um, fill, uh, filling stations. Somebody out there said hydration stations. Right? Yeah. yeah, but they're actually plumbed into the water line. And then we also have a hydration station that you can refill your water bottle and it has a counter just like you guys do here. Um, and then um, at the Shady Grove campus, they have dual flush uh, toilets and aerated sinks and composting program. And they also have a LEED certified, which is leadership in environmental excellence and design, um, academic building, and they're proposing a, a green garage. And I was just informed this morning that you have a platinum LEED certified the Galileo building. Did you guys know that? And you also have a gold hospitality culinary building here on campus. 
Um, some other things, uh, Salisbury has solar picnic tables like you do here. Um, Georgetown has a Coca-Cola partnership. I know you guys have Pepsi here, but <laughs> to put a green roof on um, some of their buildings and they have solar powered phone chargers. Um, the University of Washington has um, solar panels on three residence halls and the Hopkins, Johns Hopkins has a solar dashboard which um, they keep track of their um, students can keep up to date real time uh, energy use. So in 2015, the Dean was invited to the White House to sign on to this White House Educators Climate Change Commitment. And it was with 118 other public, he public health medicine and schools of nursing. And it's to help coordinate climate change integration and action in these uh, education institutions. There are 13 other schools of nursing on this commitment. So this is under the former administration. So I don't know if it's still available to be signed on to, but not a, you know, you can't hurt to ask. So these are the other schools of nursing. And as part of this, based on the White House commitment, um, I was asked to chair the climate change work group at the University of Maryland School of Nursing. And the goal was to increase knowledge about climate change and facilitate action of nursing students, faculty, and staff, and other health and service professionals. And so there's been a variety of other accomplishments to date, but we have climate change and sustainability on the School of Nursing website. And this picture down here is um, from an activity we did last Earth Day um, at a community fair. It was cold and rainy, but we were doing a table and um, actually an action on recycling. And we stood by the trash cans and we held open the recycling bins because the, the community had said there was no air where to recycle on that day. And we're also getting ready to um, submit an application to the Maryland Green Registry. This is um, offered and run through the Maryland Department of Environment, and it recognizes environmental excellence in institutions and businesses. Um, you have to share, implement and share five, um, at least five environmental practices, and one has to be measurable. You, you do the initial application, and then you update your profile every three years. And so, um, our measurable item is going to be our success with um, the printer phase outs. Um, we started a um, student printer phase out and pay per print um, project at least three years ago, and we just started a um, this past fall a desk side printer phase out, and we've already seen um, savings in regards to paper and toner and maintenance. So we're really excited about that. Um, we are also looking at inserting into the core nursing curriculum um, environmental health and climate change. And eventually, we're going to get to learning institutes and CE on um, climate change. And then also, as part of this endeavor, we have a small grant to um, develop a, an elective on climate change. And it's called Climate Change evidence and solutions and it was first offered this past summer and it is interdisciplinary um, we have five different pro professional institutions on campus in addition to the school of nursing and then it, it gives a background on the science and health impacts of climate change and then it goes into the professional roles of professional education um, practice op policy and advocacy and research and it has three assignments in that um, course that are applications of the, those areas. So there's a research literature search paper, an education outreach um, project, and an advocacy letter. And right now we're in the process of taking it to the graduate level so that we can, it's, I think it's, I, I mentioned that it's all online, and so that we can offer it across campus to the other five schools and hopefully um, within the University of Maryland system because 
mm, I think there's like eight institutions in Maryland or more, I don't know. Um, and so we also have other climate change activities. Um, our dean serves on the Governor's Commission on Climate Control, and she is the only healthcare representative on that commission. Um, and so as part of the White House co um, Educators Commitment, we are also part of the Global Consortium on Climate and Health Education, whose goal is to develop climate and health education for the next generation of leaders. And the Coordinating Center is out of Columbia Mailman School of Public Health in New York. And so now, the Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments. So you remember I said back at the beginning that we had developed a basic textbook for environmental health nursing? Well, it was, paper, it was hard copy and it was stagnant. And so one of the first activities that um, the Alliance did was to create an online environmental text um, textbook and accompanying um, ways that you can incorporate into the um, curriculum with, with downloadable PowerPoints, case studies, readings. Um, and so there is a chapter in that textbook on climate change and they're getting ready to start uh, a second um, edition. There's the climate change report that was released, the orange one. Um, and besides a review of the science, um, they go through regional differences um, by describing case studies and ways that nurses can reduce harm. And then nurse leaders have a voice uh, through short videos. And then policy advocacy, um, I just put this quote in from former administrator Gina McCarthy, who I just saw at the American Public Health Association last week, and she was phenomenal. Um, but So I'll just leave that quote up there for a few minutes so you can read it. Question for you about yes. that textbook. So are there, are there other chapters in it besides just climate change, right? Some folks in this room mm -hmm. may be more interested in the waste reduction chapters, et cetera, et cetera. Yep, I can pull it up. Oh. Okay, well, I'll come back to that. And it, we can pull it up if we have time at the end. Okay. So this, I hope, will come up. <laughs> this is a video that was just recently released as well. There we go. I love this video, it's very short, it's only four minutes, and I think we have time. Yes, we do. So this pretty much explains why I'm nurses. very proud to be a nurse. Nurses are unique. We're the ones in the closest day-to-day -day contact with patients, which may be why year after year, nurses are This is Charlotte Wallace, she's on the um, She works at. It gives us the chance to make a real difference in the Rundle. patients and our community. Nurses have a long history of protecting public health. From Florence Nightingale, who first brought attention to the connection between health and environment, to Lillian Wald, who helped improve health conditions in New York City tenements. Making the world a healthier place is what we do. And now we're faced with a new challenge. Our climate is changing, and our health is suffering as a result. While climate change may not be everyone's top priority, nurses have a major opportunity to help our patients and our communities live healthier lives. I've been seeing two specific impacts of climate change on health in my daily work. Asthma and she just got elected Lyme mayor. Disease. Maine has one of the highest asthma rates in the country. 13% of our adults live with asthma. We're at the end of the Gulf Stream, so the air pollution from across the country is coming into Maine. We've had immense explosion of ticks this year. Normally, the ticks die off in the winter, but that didn't happen this winter. As a former public health department director, the impacts of climate were apparent all around us. With extreme weather changes, we had increased flooding. We had seniors that had high rates of heat stroke. In southern Nevada, the, the length of our summer is longer, the heat days are more intense. The thing that I've seen is an increase 
number of respiratory illnesses, bad exacerbations of COPD. As I think about climate change, I think about the bigger picture. If we don't take action now, we don't know what the future will look like. I feel it's a moral imperative as a nurse to address it, not only for the health of our children, but also for the future of our children. No matter what kind of specialty you're in, your patients are already being impacted by climate change. As nurses, we have the power and opportunity to step up and take action on climate solutions. Here's what you can do. Get informed. Find out how climate impacts health, how solutions protect it, and what you can do. I think that as a professional nurse, it's incumbent upon me to try to educate myself as much as I can about the things that impact our patients and the environment that we live in. You don't have to have any expertise. Just be willing to learn as much as you can. Lead by example. Spread the word. The Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments has really helped me to communicate in effective ways with policymakers, local community members. Four million nurses working together can do amazing things. And now is the time for us to act. We can come together and make it possible for our children, our grandchildren, and for future generations to enjoy this beautiful planet we live in. Don't ever forget that you're not alone on this issue, that we stand shoulder to shoulder to address uh, this issue of climate change and health. The Alliance of Nurses for Healthy Environments is a network of nurses from around the country helping to integrate environmental health into our education, workplaces, and practices. Through our partnership with Climate for Health, we want to inspire and empower every nurse in America to lead on climate change. Take action now by joining our alliance and getting your own nursing organization involved with addressing climate change. Check out the communication resources at Climate for Health and learn how you can be a part of the solution. So excited every time I see that. Um, that's it. That's it. Okay, let's go back to the presentation. So I don't even need to say anymore. <laughs> okay, so I guess I have to mention the other resources that are available. Because I just want you guys to know that it's, you're not alone. Um, the American Public Health Association is one of the top three priorities for the whole organization. And just last week, it was the annual convention theme. So, there are 13 pri or 31 primary sections, and over 12, 13,000 members attended that conference in Atlanta. So for it to be the overall theme is just amazing. Um, but Physicians for Social Responsibility, it's not just physicians, there are nurses involved too, has um, information on climate change, the Union of Concerned Scientists, U.S. Climate Action Network, U.S. Climate Health Alliance. I know I probably have forgotten some, but um, they all have information and resources and ways that you can get involved on climate change. So why nurses? Well, we just heard a lot of information about why nurses in the video. but. Nurses are the number one trusted resource and um, on this and all health topics. We were only knocked down um, the year after 9-11 by firefighters. We have held that top slot since I don't know how long. And we are good at risk communication. There, we are good um, at translating difficult to understand science into understandable and usable language. We are open and honest, and we bring people in early and it's ongoing, and we listen, most importantly. We include all stakeholders. But it can be a challenge to discuss the facts about climate change. Um, there are immediate concerns of our patients and our clients, like medicine, food, shelter, but then, and there seems to be a long, far off health effects or any effects from this climate change. 
But climate change is happening, it's real, and it's here. And you all can talk about a patient that you saw in the ER with asthma, or you know, somebody who has high blood pressure, or a worker that has heat stroke because they were out in extreme heat with dehydration and um, the effects of that. So, um, so I leave you with this question, which we will be discussing at the workshop. What can you do in your professional, your personal, here at the School of Nursing, your institution, um, and you know, out in your community? This is my contact information, and these are the references and resources. <laughs> I heard that Jay wanted to go look at that. Um. Well, we have some time for some questions here. You know, a few minutes, right? While I pull up this, um, yes. Go ahead. You said it earlier, the super fun site. I don't think a lot of people know um, what those entail, and also I was thinking of like the classic example of love canal. So not only like climate change, but what is um, creating this climate change, and then the effects like. Okay, that's kind of too. So, Superfund are um, the most hazardous toxic waste sites um, in the country that are historic, and they used they were mostly illegally. Well, they didn't have regulations about what could be dumped and not dumped, so. Most of them are old um, chemical companies that just dumped their effluents or their waste on the ground because there was nobody to control um, the releases. Um, their landfills mostly, um, unregulated landfills. And so Love Canal was what got the EPA formed. It was back in the 70s, <laughs> early 70s, and it was in New York, and the land had been sold for a dollar to the school board. And, but nobody realized that it had been a former chemical manufacturing plant, and it was highly contaminated, and there was an elementary school built, and lots of kids, <laughs> came home with a variety of disorders and illnesses, and Lois Gibbs was just a mom who had two sons, and she was like, something's not right. And so she fought hard, she organized, and she rabble-roused, and she took it to the federal government well, the state health department and th up through the ranks, but she got an enough attention to form the EPA, and then later um, she, she got established the comprehensive, whatever CERCLA stands for, <laughs> um, Comprehensive Environmental Restoration and Liability Act? I, I don't know. But anyway, Superfund is the, <laughs> I know, it, it's just always been CERCLA. Um, and Superfund was created to make all these petrochemical com companies pay into a fund to <coughs> prevent or before an incident was caused, so everybody, this money, this pot of money, could be used for cleanups of these most hazardous um, sites. And um, unfortunately, the fund ran out in the early 90s. And so it's yours and my tax dollars that are paying for these cleanups. 
And then there's also brownfield sites, which is more of a state-based program, which is underused or unused, um, formerly perceived or contaminated land that is wanting to be redeveloped, but the perception of contamination is um, preventing it from being re reutilized. And so that's usually a quicker way and a more efficient way of getting something cleaned up. So, was that enough? Kind of, I wanted to, like, I know, like I said, I read some of your articles, but I was looking for more of the toxic exposure to <coughs> human health, which, you, I mean, like, this one fund kind of goes into that, but I don't think a lot of people think about that. Okay. Um, yeah, there is um, the... Let me see if I can pull up the list of... Now, EPA has redone their website. So it's not easy to find a lot of stuff on the website. Robin's looking for this. I will say that one of the country's most notorious Superfund sites is actually not too terribly far south of here. Some of you may know the story of Trees, Kansas, or uh, Pitcher, Oklahoma, where you had uh, lots of lead and zinc contamination based upon mining down there uh, in the, in the uh, early 20th century, which has led to both those towns being completely bought out and abandoned. <coughs> so uh, that's only about an hour and a half drive south of here. So back to Robert's point that there are lots of uh, environmental health concerns that are all around you that you don't necessarily know about. There we go. Okay. So is, is Greg Pruitt trying to make sure you can't find you? <coughs> okay, so let's see. Kansas is region seven, right? So, looks like, uh, I don't know what the code is for this, but um, I think this is probably a NPL site, yes, proposed NPL. So I could get into a whole big discussion on proposed versus final, um, which I don't th I think this would overwhelm you, but um, so if you can look here, the, um, a red square is a proposed, a yellow diamond is a final, a green circle is a deleted, and so there's this whole big process. Um, of basic NPL for information. Um, so, is there, uh, I have a quick question. Was there a resource or somewhere that would show data that uh, showing the correlation of public health in real numbers? I know we saw a lot of nurses giving anecdotal sort of uh, things that we can look at, heat stroke and, and uh, mm -hmm. respiratory issues and whatnot. But uh, is there um, statistics on that data between sites of environmental mm -hmm. um, toxin and uh, health issues or um, a rise with uh, global climate change um, and a rise in 
You would like to think so. <laughs> but um, unfortunately, um, yeah, on the climate change stuff, it would be the national climate assessment, right? Right. Um, but it's not as fine as a link between a specific site and a specific health effect. Um, there is something called um, environmental public health tracking out of the CDC, but unfortunately, um, Kansas is not a grantee state. But Loveland, we saw a lot of those effects with the women's fertility issues, right? So yes. wouldn't that be an example of the effects of these toxin ways that they were living upon and then women who constantly were not able to keep their baby to term or have severe effects from it? Then of course you're all aware of things like uh, lead pollution and, uh, and drinking water, right? You know, Flint, Michigan, and of course that's what happened down the trees and the uh, picture. So I'm trying to pull up the the A P text. Okay, so most of these questions are covered in this textbook. And like I said, it's an online living document. So these are the why nursing, harmful environmental exposures in vulnerable populations, environmental health sciences, practice settings, sustainable communities, climate change, energy advocacy research. And then there's also tools um, back up here. Well, no, it's environ.org, and it was in that. Um, it's on page thirty. On that. Yeah. So it's just environ.org, but I'm also looking to see if the yeah the strategies for incorporating into nursing curricula is also there. But the question about climate change in particular, uh, the subsection of the National Climate Assessment, which has a whole descriptor on human health effects, which you can then just keep drilling down and keep drilling down, following link after link, and there's some good stuff there. Particularly that's where you, the National Climate Assessment, just do a web search for that. The latest edition of that's actually rolling out as we speak, um, despite the current administration, which has been somewhat interesting. White House just released a climate change report that said climate change is happening. So, uh, I realize it makes some folks in the room for, for whom the notion of climate change is not something you really want to talk about or, 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 or embrace. But understand that as nurses in your clinical environments, you have an awful lot of power to reduce waste, talk to your patients. And so, regardless of where you find your entry point here, I think there's some real, probably some real value. And uh, Rob, by the way, Robin does respond to emails. I can attest to that. I know that you will be around for the workshop and you can get to this stuff in much more granular detail. So uh, any, 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 any final, any last question for Robin for this session? Yes. Post your information, your email. Yeah. But it's in the thousands.